I was just tired of people's opinions on a very sacred thing between me and the Lord for nine years. I was tired of the spotlight, honestly, because I didn't do the right things I needed to do in order to be healthy in the spotlight. So the Holy Spirit doesn't lie. Something needed to change. <laughs> a warm welcome to a daisy. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate that. Can I move this? Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Great. I, I do not. It's nice, but thank you, sir. I'm going to move this back, too, so I can get up and talk to you guys in front of it sometimes. How are we doing? Great, someone said. Nice. Uh, like Jake said, my name is a Daisy, and I love being back with you all this year. You probably have been asked this already, but just so I know, who all was here last October? At the, okay, we got some people. What up, my people? Just the few of you, like four people. But um, cool. Well, if you were here last year or listened or whatever, you might remember that I introduced myself as the pastor of worship and care at Lighthouse Church here in Denver. But um, since then, pretty recently actually, some things have changed. There's been a significant change. Uh, this past August marked nine years of full-time worship ministry for me. And the Holy Spirit was like, Daisy, you will not reach your 10 healthily if you keep going the way you are going. So something needs to change. <laughs> and uh, this wasn't a shock to me. I, I had been running pretty unhealthily for a while. Uh, there were a lot of changes that went on in our church, and um, I didn't deal with them all the best, to be honest with you. Um, and also just worship like using my voice to worship the Lord, uh, playing guitar to worship the Lord, it's one of my favorite ways to connect with the Lord, like since I was little. And so a lot of times over the last like nine years, I felt like my worship to the Lord has become about everybody else. Like even in my personal time with the Lord, I was like, okay, Lord, what do you want to say to the church this Sunday? And maybe some of you in that position, you don't have to prepare that way, but that's how I felt I needed to prepare. And so I started feeling like kind of selfish and, and guilty that I wanted my time with the Lord back just for me. Um, it was very much like part of the job as a worship pastor for me anyway, that the way that I worshiped on stage was under critique quite a bit. And not always bad critique, but critique. And so if I'm not worshiping in a way that makes sure everybody in the room can worship too, or if I'm not shepherding well enough or talking enough for my leaders or co-workers, then my leadership gets put under a spotlight, right? And, or if I'm leading um, a practice, an hour-long practice, and uh, the people that I'm worshiping with on stage, my volunteers, if I talk a little quickly to them because I'm trying to get us through the practice, my leadership gets called into the question, right? Or if I'm in the lobby and people don't get talked to enough as they want to maybe because there's only one of me and so many of them at a certain campus I was at, my leader should be called into question. And it just, it, I was exhausted, you all. I was exhausted. Um, I was just tired of people's opinions on a very sacred thing between me and the Lord for nine years. I was tired of the spotlight, honestly. It felt like I had to be perfect. All eyes were on me, I don't get breaks. I lost a friend recently and I felt like I couldn't even totally mourn him because I had to get to work two days later and be on stage. And it just felt like in the spotlight I was alone because I didn't do the right things I needed to do in order to be healthy in the spotlight. So the Holy Spirit doesn't lie, something needed to change. <laughs> And I can now say, as Jake kind of alluded to, I am now the creative arts pastor at Lighthouse Church here in Denver. And out of the spotlight, and you all, I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, did it take some surrender? Yes, 100%, it did. Like seeing my name on our staff page for the first time without worship underneath it, and the first time in nine years, it made me feel some sort of way. Like I had to surrender some stuff. But also it was like really bittersweet because I felt so much peace. Like I was so relieved that no one was really looking to me on Sundays to start something. That I could be behind the scenes and be taking photos and videos and actually I'm more accessible to our church because they can come up to me and ask for prayer during the service. Like for me, that's what I needed. It was restorative for my soul. And church friend, I will 
probably always talk about matters of the heart when I'm up here. <laughs> like, you all have a plethora of people who um, are really equipped to talk to you about like physical tools of how to do your job well or how to do your role well. But um, for me, I will always talk about spiritual tools because without those, we don't really need to mess with the physical tools. So here's the thing. I don't believe that humans were made for the spotlight. I don't believe we were made to get glory of any kind. And I don't just mean like the spotlight, like this right here on a stage. I mean like any proverbial spotlight in your area of ministry. And in Isaiah 43, God is talking to his people and he is telling them, do not fear, I've redeemed you, all those things, I've called you by name, you are mine. And so after he says that in verse seven of Isaiah 43, he says, everyone who is called by my name, I created for my glory. I formed them and made them. We were made for God's glory, not ours. And any glory we get is really just a cheap knockoff of the king of glory. And no other industry do, is the attention so much on us when the goal is to put the attention on God. So now that we've, you know, this is kind of how church in America has evolved, right? We have, um, whether we're on staff or in a volunteer space or whatever your, your case may be, we are in some way in the spotlight. Some way, shape, or form. We have set ourselves up to get glory. So this is kind of our problem now. Like we either need to shut off all the lights and switch how we do our, sh our church or we just kind of figure out how to deal with this well how to navigate these spotlights we have created for ourselves. Whether it's how quickly we change lyric slides or how, how we harmonize or how well we do production lights or the sound quality, how we interact with people because they come up to us for, for leadership, right? So because we weren't made for the spotlight, we gotta be vigilant about tossing the glory back to God. And I believe the Lord has given us many tools to do this. So I was just talking to a couple of guys over there in the corner. Um, online, the subject of my talk is, I think, from last year's. That's my fault to Jake, because I didn't get him what I was talking about this year quick enough. But um, I'm actually going to be talking about freedom from being a slave to the spotlight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and maybe you're a bit like me, and you kind of loathe the spotlight. <laughs> um, maybe you kind of loathe at least the certain ways that you've been put into the spotlight. Maybe it hasn't always been healthy ways. Maybe no one like shepherded you as you stepped into the spotlight. Maybe you miss not being seen, not having all eyes on you, just getting like time to enjoy like humble positions of the church. Or maybe you crave the spotlight. Like maybe you've been in the background for way too long for your liking and you're like, oh, I want my chance. Maybe you're tired of being overlooked or someone else getting the spotlight over and over again while your humble work seems to be ignored. Maybe you're feeling stifled that you haven't been given the spotlight yet, that you can't be at all of who you want to be or who you feel God has called you to be. Maybe you're somewhere in between, wanting the spotlight and hating the spotlight. Or maybe you ping pong back and forth. Whatever you find yourself, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to free us from being slaves to the spotlight, from being obsessed with thinking about the spotlight or ever being a slave to the spotlight if you don't, ever, if you don't really struggle with that. And some ways that you can identify if you might be a slave to the spotlight is movement of the spotlight bothers you. Like if it's no longer on you and it shifts to someone else, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Or if who's in the spotlight really bugs you. They don't deserve that. Or if, you know what, I'm gonna stop there. You guys get it. <laughs> and please hear me, y'all. I am not perfect. I do not have this all figured out. I just spent the beginning of this show telling you about my struggles in the spotlight. 
I've messed up a lot. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is continually refining me about this stuff. Praise God. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all today about things I have learned and I'm still learning today from being in the spotlight. Things that I did that helped me in the spotlight, things I wish I did or at least did more when I was in the spotlight. And I'm, I'm still in the spotlight now. I'm just in it a different way. So these are things that even help me adjust. And I just pray the Lord will bless and empower you through these things. So open heart, open mind. As we talk about freedom from being a slave to the spotlight. So these are my five ways to help yourself be free of the slavery to the spotlight. I'm just going to go through the, oh, not five, four, my bad. I miscounted four ways. One is why. I'm going to give you like trigger words for it. One is why. Two is community. Three is feedback. Not the bad kind and sound. Four is partake. So why, community, feedback, partake. So let's start with number one. Remember your why. Go back to it often. Why are you in ministry? Why do you even want to do the role that you are doing? Or maybe the right question for you is, why don't you want to be in the role that you're in? Why don't you enjoy maybe what you would call the small spot that you're in? Why are you looking so much to the next thing, to the bigger thing? Like you're itching to get out of where you are, which we'll come back to later. Usually, friends, what we are wrestling with in ministry can be drawn back to the fact that our why is off, or we have forgotten it, or it's misguided. If you can't truthfully share your why with your leader, your coworker, your volunteer, is it because somewhere deep down you know your why is more you-centered than God-centered? Maybe we're not even sure like what our why is. We're not maybe sure how to explain it. We maybe like know what we're doing up here, but actually saying it out might be kind of difficult. And that's okay, as long as we don't remain there. Like, let's, let's figure it out together. So, I'm going to give you all one minute. Take out your phones, a piece of paper, something in your Bible, whatever you want to do. I want us to take some time, and if this is too short of time for you, please take some time later and sit with this and really um, spend some time with it. But we're going to write down our why. So I'm going to give you one minute. Go. About 30 seconds left. All right, one minute later, how are we feeling? <laughs> okay, if you haven't read, read your why back to yourself. Take stock of how you're feeling about your why. Are we feeling good about it? Are we feeling guilty? And if either one, why is that? Would you be confident to share with the room your why? I'm not gonna ask you to do that, but like, take stock of how you feel. Take stock, talk of if it makes you feel ashamed or if you're like, heck yeah, let's talk about it. And why or why not is that? It might be helpful to talk to someone else who is in arms with you in ministry about your why. And you may have many whys. You may go home later and have more to write down. That's amazing. 
But wherever you find yourself, let me remind you of Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, amen, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You all, remembering your why will help you care less about the spotlight. It will help you keep the main thing, the main thing, which is Jesus. It will help you line up everything to the gospel. By God's grace, your why is like gospel-centered. And it will help you release things you're holding on to that have no eternal weight. Remembering your why will help you see the spotlight for what it truly is. Literally just a spotlight, especially in comparison to the amazing, overwhelming, beautiful, mighty power of the light of the world. In comparison, our spotlights are nothing. So that's number one. Why? Okay, let's move on to number two, community. Friends, we need community. especially us leaders. Just because we're leaders doesn't mean we don't need community. We're not above community. Do not downplay the importance of the people God has put around you in ministry. God wastes nothing. So even if you don't get along with them or don't like them very much, God wastes nothing. So that person on your team who you're really frustrated with because of the way they do things differently than you, God is using that person to refine you to make you better. It's actually a blessing. I know that's crazy, the person that annoys you is a blessing. Like what? I promise you, God wastes nothing. He works all things together for our good. Because think about it, like, we are all the best people without community. I'm the most patient person when ain't nobody around to test my patience. (laughs) I am the most loving person when I don't have anyone I have to love. Like, they're over there. Love you, you know? I'm the best communicator on the planet when there's no one around misunderstanding me or disrespecting me. Hello. In isolation, we're all saints. (laughs) And it can feel like we're our best selves when we're by ourselves, like when no one's around to bring out the crap in us. But it's in community, friends. It's up close and personal. When you start to see patterns in your life, like real weaknesses, real flaws, real sins, real insecurities start coming out when other people are around. That's why the enemy wants you to stay in isolation, in the spotlight, or out of it, really. So it's in community where those things get exposed, and we need those things exposed, friends. As leaders, we have to have those things exposed. Which means, for us leaders, community is essential, not optional. Really for everybody alive, but especially for us leaders trying to lead God's churches. Outside of community, friends, you and I will never be the leaders God has called us to be. Community is like the laboratory where we get to learn to lean on the Holy Spirit and where we get to see the transforming power of the gospel that we push forward every Sunday or every weekend. I read this analogy recently where um, we like to think of community as the safety net underneath the tightrope walker. Like just there in case we need it. Great to have if something goes wrong. Whereas the Bible actually describes community as the tightrope itself. Like you can't move forward without it. Here are some verses for you to remind you. This is Romans 12.10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 2 Corinthians 13.11. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And Ephesians 4 again. 
Verse 32 this time, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God forgave you. You all, we need all of these one another's in the Bible. That's how we know we need community. So do you have it? Do you have community? Do you have an honest and, and humble community that knows what you do in ministry and can speak into how you show up toward others in ministry? And if you don't, if you don't have that kind of community, ask the Holy Spirit to bring those people into your life. Ask him to make you aware of like, ooh, this could be somebody. This is good to have people that we can give permission to, to like come into our space and be like, hey, I don't want to have any blind spots, so will you tell me when I um, not think the best of others? Hey, will you let me know when I act one way with a congregant and another way with a volunteer? Obviously, all of that in love when they point that out to you because we got to be intentional with this, but it can, we got to be prepared for the ouches too because it doesn't feel good to have your ish pointed out by anybody. But it's worth our spiritual growth. It is worth our healthy leadership. And it will help us remain humble in the spotlight. It will help us not even need the spotlight, like not idolize it. It'll help us not despise the spotlight either if we hate it, because either way, you will see yourself and the spotlight realistically. Like, you will see the effects of the spotlight and be able to deal with it. So that's number two, community. Number three is feedback. Friends, we got to be open to feedback. We got to open ourselves up to feedback from those who lead you, from those you lead with, and from those you lead. Like every, every section, those you lead, those you lead with, and those you lead. This kind, this kind of thing is somewhat tied to number two um, in community, but this is specifically for people you don't really consider your community because they're maybe just your pastor or just your coworker or just your volunteer. Not just in a bad way. You guys get what I'm saying? But this group of people in the life of a leader is just as important as community. Because what would happen if this week you asked your leader for three things you can work on? Three ways you can improve. What if you asked a teammate how you can support them better without asking for it back? <laughs> like without asking them to ask you the same question because you might be disappointed. And that's not the point. What would happen if you asked a volunteer for some blind spots? Because that's different. They'll have a different answer than your community because they're under you. They see you as a leader, they interact with you in a different way than your community does, right? And if the idea of asking for feedback makes you feel a little uncomfortable, good. Probably means you need it. <laughs> also, if it does make you uncomfortable, ask the Holy Spirit why that is. And then ask yourself, like, why not? What's the worst that would happen? What do you have to lose? Obviously have discernment for who you ask. Don't ask the congregant. That's always like the sound is way too loud. They will just say that. That's your problem. <laughs> that's not constructive. But pastors who preach, do you have someone who you can ask um, or who will give you feedback on the way that you communicate with people on stage and off stage? Do you have someone production managers who run lights amazingly, do you have someone that'll be like, yeah, but your volunteers can't really talk to you, so you're not really loving people well. Realize, <laughs> say, out. I wasn't trying to come for you. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, <laughs> love you, just playing, whoever that was. But anyway, realize that uh, God's role that he has placed you in, like realize the importance of that and steward it well. Take responsibility of your role by asking for feedback often. The feedback you get may reveal that you have some people you need to apologize to and humble yourself and say like, hey, I'm really sorry. <laughs> that was not my heart. And it can mend relationships when you ask for some feedback and you ask for some forgiveness. Proverbs 15, verse 31 through 33 says this. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. 
Those who disregard discipline despise themselves. Some other translations say destroy themselves. But the one who heeds correction gains understanding. This is the blessing of getting comfortable with feedback, with correction. And, and the feedback doesn't have to always be bad. Like you can ask for two levels of growth and three things that you do well, or you can flip that. Three things you need to work on, two things you do amazingly, keep going. That way you're not constantly feeling beat up or like you're an awful person, but you're not also only getting puffed up. And then pray through the feedback you receive, friends. You're also asking imperfect humans about feedback, so they're not gonna be perfect in it, but line it up with the word of God, take it back to the Holy Spirit, and ask like, okay, yeah, that one made me feel kind of some way, it's probably true, you know, like, be honest with yourself. Ask what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you, especially if you start noticing a pattern. This will help you not look to others or to the spotlight for your validation. And it will remind you of your worth in Jesus, not in others' approval of you. That way you actually can just take feedback, because it's like, this doesn't define me. Okay, let's go. Come on. Jesus defines me. He's going to help me through it. I'm imperfect. I'm being redeemed. So that's number three, feedback. All right, and our last one, number four, is partake. Don't forget to let yourself partake. Don't forget to take part. If you're serving and leading every single Sunday or weekend, if you have Saturday and whatever services, take pauses. Like, when do you just receive? Do you ever just receive? Or are you always the one outpouring? Do you ever attend only? Not attend and be like, um, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. You know how we all do. Don't do that. Do you ever just attend or, or even go to another church where you have no, no one knows who you are? Go to a prayer service from another service. I, I went to House Denver a couple weeks ago. If you are local, you might know it. And it was so good to just sit there and just receive and let other people lead me. You get refilled. Are you okay with not being in charge? Do you judge when you're not in charge? It can be so easy to let our jobs be this like subconscious excuse for not pressing into the Lord in our own personal times or spending time with Jesus privately or in community. And it can happen without us even realizing it. That we no longer pursue hearing the Holy Spirit unless we're on stage or in front of other people. We can too often let what's happening in the service just pass us by because we're just doing our jobs. So take a step back. Take a step out to get poured into. Receive. Get refreshed and spend time to just be part of the church again. You may need to have a convo with one of your leaders like, hey, can I have one Sunday a month, please, to just attend? which might mean you need to pour into your volunteers more and share the spotlight so they can learn how to lead when you're not there. A church can happen without you. Let others shine. (laughs) When the spotlight's on you, share it. Be quick to share it. Don't hog it. Don't don't be afraid to step out of it because you might lose it. Trust the Lord. like He's in control. If he wants you to lose it, maybe you need to lose it. And when you return to your role at the church, like when you go and then come back, hopefully with fresh eyes and fresh heart, realize the role you're in, big or small, God is using you mightily. Maybe the reason the Lord hasn't moved you from like the humble spot that you're at is because, yeah, he's using it to refine you, but maybe it's also because you're not ready for the bigger thing yet. You're not ready for the bigger spotlight because you're walking in division all the time (laughs) or you're being consumed with other people's ish. Don't diminish what the Holy Spirit is doing in your present role, in your present spotlight. Understand the assignment. Be faithful in the small things because God, he, he might be preparing you for the bigger things. 
But maybe the bigger thing is you learning how to believe the best in others right where you are. Or you recognizing your tendency to use other people to meet your needs first. Or maybe the bigger thing is you learning to surrender the bigger thing. <laughs> and just be content with where you're at with the smaller things to realize that the spotlight is not the prize Jesus is. So friends, no matter what level you're at, like leaders of the church, volunteers in the church, in front and behind, whatever, we have to fight the temptation of being slave to the spotlight. And this takes discipline, and we can't do it on our own. We need God's help, and we need the help of others. So think about your why. Remember your why. Take advantage of the blessing of community. Seek out feedback. And partake in the church. Receive from the ministry that you're a part of. The world does not need more slaves to the spotlight. The world needs people that have come alive in who they are in Jesus, not who they are in the spotlight and have the same energy, vigor, zeal as they do in the spotlight that they do out of it. That's what our world needs. That's what our churches need. So I encourage you, take the steps you need to be healthy in the spotlight. In four great ways, like those trigger words that I gave you earlier, why, community, feedback, and partake. All right? Thank you, guys. God bless you.